and that is not of God. Acts chapter 6 verse 5 says, This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Proclus, Nicolai, Timoth, Parmenius, and Nicholas, Nicholas, from Antioch, a covenant to Judaism. Another possibility is that Nicolaitans is in itself a code name for those who like to lord it over others. R-O-L-O-R-D. Those who love to lord it over what others. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 24 says, Not that we lord it over your faith. Not that we lord it, not N-O-T. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we wait with you for your joy because it is by faith you stand faith. It is by faith you do what? Yeah. 3 John chapter 1 verse 9 to 10 there says, I have written something to the church, but Diophilus, who likes to put this himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. Does not acknowledge what? Our authority. So if I come, I'll bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, and not content with that, he refused to welcome the brothers, and also stops those who want to, and he puts them out of the church. What am I saying? In the house of God, there is order. And here he is telling, I've written this, and he speaks about the offers. Who does not acknowledge the authority? Acknowledge the authority of what? In every place, in a home, there is the authority of a, a father and a mother. At the workplace, there is the authority of the bosses. And in the church, there is the authority of those that are in the leadership. So, in everything for us to walk in tranquility and to receive the blessings of God, we honor authority. Now, if we say we don't honor authority, how can we honor God that we do not see? The Bible teaches us, you know, if we, I say, I, I don't love you, but I love God, I mean that. Because how can I love God, whom I cannot see, when I fail to love you? Do you know that the major problem today in the church is that the believers, there is no love for one another. And that, that is the most dangerous thing. Now, what is sin? Sin is transgression of law, breaking God's rule. Whenever they sin, you have broken God's rule. What happens when I break the law of the United States? I'm thrown into jail. They don't say, this is David Shemenda, is a good man. Whenever I break the law, they throw me into what? Into prison. So also the Bible says, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, says, everyone who practices sin also practices lowness, and the sin is lowness. So when you find yourself, you're walking into difficulties because you are practicing you are breaking the law according to the constitution and the government of God. Amen? We, when you break the law, if I break the law here, if I come, I steal things in here, what happens? If I come, I started shooting everybody here, what happens? I'll be in jail because I've broken the what? The law. Now, what happens when we sin against God? God also has a day whereby he will reveal to us the consequences of breaking the law. Sin is not knowing to do good, but not doing it. Sin is not knowing. Sin is knowing to do good, but refuse to do good. That's what I meant to say. Sin is knowing to do good. When you sin, you know what is supposed to be done, but you choose deliberately. I'm just going to offend. I'm going not to do the right thing. That's the sin there. Amen? And how many of us have done something when you know you are doing something wrong, but you choose to do that? You have sinned. Amen? That's what the Bible says. That's what was happening with Nicolaitans and the church at Ephesus. Sin is anything that is not of faith, not trusting in God. How many people say, I think God is not helping me. I'm just going to go my ways, find out and do what I want to do. That's a sin. The person who is in sin doesn't want to be in the confines of law. The person who 
was rebellion, the person who wants to steal doesn't want to honor those that are in authority. The police officer is not a problem. The problem is because you have broken the law. And when they restrain you at the foot of the handicaps, it's because you have broken the law. So when we break the law, there are consequences and repercussions of what we pay because of breaking the law. Also, Romans chapter 14, verse 23 says, But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat, because their eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. Is what? Sin. Sin is unrighteousness, wickedness. Amen. All wrongdoing is sin. All wrongdoing is what? Sin. Let's say it together. All wrongdoing is what? Sin. Are we together? All wrongdoing is what? So remember when you leave this place, you go home, every wrongdoing, you know you have sin. And it says, I found it written in the Bible. All wrongdoing is what? And there is sin that does not lead to death. Sin is a disease of the soul. The inner part of man that lives for you. Sin is a disease of the soul. The inner part of the man that does what? That lives for him. So always ask God to refresh in your soul so that you are not in sin. Psalms 41 verse 4 says, David said, I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul. Heal my what? My soul, for I have sinned against you. Sin is foolish, foolishly thinking. We can ignore God. The neglectors, they did the things and they felt they can ignore who? God. The thought of foolishness is sin. And the discorner is an abomination to what? To men. Also, the letter was, you know, when you go back, you begin to see the things that God put. And the reason why God was putting those things was to warn the church. Here are three steps to overcoming sin. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Remember the height that you have me. And remember how much you serve God. Your first love. That's what God was telling this church. Repent for your backsliding or falling away. You have to repent. Come to the point where you say, God, I've done something wrong. Restore the good deeds you did at first. Restore, look at the good deeds and say, God, one time I walked in the anointing where I even my shadow perform the signs and the wonders. Long for those days. Where, where you are, where you are is where you lay your treasures. Where are your treasures laid? Are your treasures laid in heaven? Or your treasures are laid where the moth of this world can reach? You know, Revelation chapter 2 verse 9 says, I know you are friction and you are poor, yet you are rich. And I know about the slander of those who say, they are Jews and they are not, but are in the synagogue of Satan. <laughs> I hate that God looks at our church and says, this was a church of Satan. I hate God that he looks at any other church and says, this was a church of Satan. But you know that these days there are churches of Satan, but they are to the form of godliness, but they deny the power of God. They are churches, they are synagogue. And the Bible tells us, what kind of knowledge did Jesus have concerning this man of church? He knew about their poverty of the Christians in Smyrna. He knew how poor this church was. He knew they were serving under the most difficult circumstances. Their property was being seized and the men had no source of personal income. Those of us in this generation, we think of poverty in terms of not having enough money to live comfortably. These guys, they are not talking like that. These guys were looking on the way how God was about to reward them and bless them spiritually. To the brethren in the church at Smyrna, it was not having an acceptable relationship with God. Jesus knew about the group in Smyrna who falsely called themselves Jews. Jesus knows that in this generation there are people who falsely call themselves Christian. They have the form of godliness. But they deny the power of God. They are not walking according to the precepts of God. They even called their, their place of worship synagogue, referring it 
was a synagogue for God, but Jesus called it a synagogue for Satan. Those are dangerous ways to be saved. Jesus was revealing also to John not to fear those who kill the body. How many of us will please people instead of pleasing God? Matthew chapter 10 verse 28 tells us, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. The church in this manner, they are pleasing those who could kill the body. And that's the way the church of these days is. We are so program oriented. We are so people pleasing. We are to do what we feel is right rather than doing what we think God wants to be done. It's important to come to the point where we realize what God wants to do. And as we begin to realize and submit ourselves to the guidance and the leadership of God, here it is a great lesson that we need to learn. There is no real greater power and exception that we comes from God. Satan will test us, but only because God allows us in order that we may be strengthened. When you are tested by the devil, do not be afraid. It's only for a short time so that your faith may be strengthened. How many have been tested by the devil? How many have gone through a difficult moment? You know, but all tests doesn't mean that you are a sinner. There are temptations, but temptation doesn't make you compromise. Temptation causes you to stand on who God is. Jesus promised the heavenly crowns for those of accounts. One of the crowns that he promised is the imperishable crown. I don't have much time, but you can read on your own time. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. The crowns of rejoicing. The crowns of life. The crowns of righteousness. He promised all those crowns. Then the crowns of God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 and 4. Be shepherds of good flock that is under your care, watching them. Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to sin. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the throne. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of God. And they, that will never fade away. That will never what? Fade. fade away. Now, in closing, I wanted to bring you to some few points. How some people, you know, these days, because... You know, it saddens me. Sometimes I find myself crying and weeping and seeking the face of God. You know, you can come. We have that in the history in Christian life. Because in the olden days, people that went to church knowing that I may not even come home, I would die. In these days, we don't care about that. We have come to the point whereby we don't care. Neil, in AD 64, was being, being wrong and blamed the Christian for crucifying Jesus. He threw Christians into pits with wild animals. He executed Paul. Possibly. Possibly. Peter as well. There were people that were killed for the sake of Jesus. Are you ready to die for him? Domitians in AD 90 to 96. He killed thousands in Rome. Banished John to the islands of Patmos. Domitians is the one who sent John to the island of Patmos. How many of us today would love to be sent over there? Since we're living in the modern time. Trajan in AD 104 to 117. He outlawed the Christians and begged the Ignatius at stake. Those days, people that would go to the church and never know whether they'll make it back home. You and I, these days, we know. We come to the house of God and go back home. We literally even complain for nothing. It's, that's how lukewarm this church in this generation has become. We are not so godly minded, we are things oriented. We have lost the love of God. What about men like Marcus Olysius, who was tortured and beheaded? Who beheaded the Christians? Christians 
They were beheaded, they go to church, and they found them, they gather them, and they say, kneel down there and deny Jesus, and they cast out the cattle, the hands of everyone. How many of us would have come to this church today? If you know that you are, you are going to be at the danger of having your head in heaven. These are the things that these Christians they were going through. Severus, Dane, and the crucified and beheaded Christians. Maximinus, extruded Christian. Deuces, tried to wipe out all the Christians and extruded those whom he could find. The head in this house, there's a Christian that is living there. He knocked at the door and they got a hold of you and they arrested you. There's a number of them. One of them that I remember, he banged all the Christians. He banged all the scriptures. They got even one cliff and they banged him. When they had buried him, they first they killed him and then they said, we don't want his demons to come and haunt us. They went and they picked him from the ground, bent him into ashes, and they threw his ashes into the river. And they says, you go and they spread all over the world, not knowing that they are spread in the word of God. Saints, Christianity is not as easy as we think. Yet these days we have taken the things of God so little. We have taken the work of the living God so useless. You know, going to church is because I need to be in the house of God. How many are in the house of God? Because you hunger for God. You long to be in His presence. You desire to know Him in the fullest of His glory. You surrender and they come to the point where you say, God, not my will, but your will. How many can surrender their lives for Jesus? Oh, what God desires us in this generation. He wants us to be sold out for you. Not sold out because something good is happening. The Mackenzie's many years ago, they sang a song, they sang a song. God is on the mountain. It's the same God on the valley. How many knows that you can still praise God when you're on the valley? A number of us who only praise God when things are going well. But I have desired, decided and the purpose in my heart. I know nothing is happening. I'm ready to praise God. If I stand by myself, I still praise God. If I'm in the valley, I still praise God. If I'm in a lonely place alone, I still praise God. If I'm around the dead bodies like Ezekiel, I still praise God. And ask God, can these bodies live again? God is calling us to be those Christians that will stand and be on the high forever rather than be the church of Ephesus. I believe God is calling this church this generation church to repent because our love for God is when we see success. When we don't see success, we go to the point whereby we are so discouraged. We ask so many questions. The reason why we discourage is because we have the first love, but when things have gone down, we lose the first love. But God, He's testing us to find out are we going to still say that God when things are not looking the way how they used to look? Are we going to stand? Praise in the midst of love. Are we going to jump up and say, Of all I walk alone, nobody goes with me, I'll still praise. God wants to see you and I magnify the name that is above another name. Whereby you can stand alone in the coldest place and still say, God, I love you. In the winter of Buffalo, you can be in the still strength and say, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior.
when they feel the presence of the living God. That's when they jump out. Revival is not in the church. Revival is in our bedrooms. Revival is in our secret place. Revival is when you're walking in the midst of the God. You know, I have known what it means to say to God. When I'm in the church, I enjoy the mob psychology. But when I'm out, that's when my faith is tested. That's when God checks me. Are you going to praise me? Or are you going to feel lonely? I shall and be yourself. And nobody seems like they care. God is calling us to war. God is calling us to victory. God is 
Fire, sir. Fire, sir. In Jesus' name. 